Thank you. Um, I noticed you didn't say where the assistant professorship was held. Is in Novakushniks in, in Siberia. <laughs> okay, so as um, was explained, I'm a, an osteopath by training, uh, and I still do osteopathy with my patients. You know, as the more manual side of the work, as well as the uh, speciality that I've developed um, in the biochemistry field. So a lot of the ideas that you're going to meet today that I'm going to share are ones that I've developed but I've based them on good science. And people will ask, where do you get your information from? And I collect it from texts, from the internet, from uh, biochemistry recordings, tapes, updates, like Jeffrey Brand's work. Um, but I use basically Harper's Biochemistry. And some of the work today will come straight out of Harper's Biochemistry, uh, which is very interesting because we're going to talk a lot about light and particular frequencies. And the amazing thing is what we're going to be talking about here is actually written down in Harper's Biochemistry. And I was fascinated because he, who isn't Harper anymore, because obviously there's different authors, Harper was presumably a biochemist back in 1900s or 1800s, actually talks about the build-up of materials that don't convert enzymatically into the end products. And so you get a relative toxicity of the substrates and a deficiency of the end products. And it's lovely to see that actually in writing there, um, because that's what we base our whole fi functional biochemistry on. So the basis is when something is needed by the body, the body will strengthen, or a weak indicator muscle associated with that will strengthen. And if there's a substrate that builds up because the enzyme isn't functioning properly, uh, then the body or the muscles tend to weaken. Okay, so it weakens to an excess or a relative excess, strengthens to a deficiency. And then what we do is we look for the cofactors and coenzymes which open those enzyme pathways up. So when we talk about coenzymes, we usually talk about activated vitamin Bs, or there's a few other ones which are coenzymes in addition. And cofactors are always minerals which act to open the enzymes up to get them to work, like magnesium, zinc, iron, calcium, etc. Right, so those are the sort of terms that we're going to be using. So the topic today um, is something new. Um, we, uh, Jill and I, ran this in Dublin uh, in April. So we've had a bit of a dummy run. And um, so I know that there's too much information in here to cover in one day. This really is a weekend type of seminar. But I wanted to give you all the information because some of it you'll be able to read in your own time. What I want to do is the clinical aspects, mainly, of it, of how you put this into practice with your patients. Okay? So the topic is oxygen, the ultimate nutrient. Do you know that 80% of patients show to one condition being the root cause of their illnesses? Now, had you asked me that a year ago, I would have thought it's magnesium deficiency, it's zinc deficiency, it's a virus. Uh, I would never have dreamt that it was something so simple, which is always overlooked. It's often talked about, but nobody ever explains it more than B12 or iron. And the answer to that is hypoxia. And as we get into it, you'll realize that hypoxia means a deficiency, not an absence, a deficiency of oxygen within the system. Okay. Now, this is not serious enough to cause death, um, and it's not serious enough to cause symptoms where people can't make it into your treatment rooms. Um, but it's serious enough to promote the degeneration and deterioration of people's health. So the 10 most common medical symptoms that people come into all practitioners with, okay, not just kinesiologists, but medical prof uh, profession, osteopaths, chiropractors. For osteopaths and chiropractors, it's probably backache. Um, that includes any sort of spinal musculoskeletal condition, really, not just low back pain, okay? But musculoskeletal, it could be neck pain that they come in with. But the most common one is actually fatigue. People are tired. And I find that almost all my patients complain about that. So hardly anybody ever comes in and says, actually, my energy's great. Because you say, well, why are you here? <laughs> because most people will say, well, I've got this pain, uh, I've got these problems, and I'm tired, okay? 
and you say, oh, okay, there must be a common link between the tiredness, the aches and pains, and all the symptoms you've got. And then they're amazed, because they assume that the tiredness, the aches and pains are all separate problems, but in fact they're all tied in together. So fatigue, and it's usually fatigue which is unremitting from rest. So these are people who get a night's sleep, but they're not refreshed from the sleep. Okay? If you've done a hard day's work, or you're exercising a lot with your sport, and you rest, and the next day you're ready to go, go, go again, that's fine, that's normal. But if you wake up every morning and you're tired, and that tiredness doesn't go during the day, except for brief periods maybe, then that's what we're looking for. Colds, which includes really any sort of minor sort of infection, nothing too sinister. Um, respiratory tract infections, in other words, you've got a cough, and there were certainly plenty of those around in the winter and the spring this year, weren't there? Abdominal pains of all description. Okay? So you could label them all as irritable bowel, um, whatever, but abdominal pains. Anxiety and depression. And that's rather sad, really, isn't it, that anxiety and depression should be so high up in the list of what people go to see a doctor or a medical person for. Uh, and some of those are exogenous and some are endogenous. And endogenous meaning that they're within the body because of changes in the biochemistry. And exogenous meaning because of outside reasons in, of life and in relationships, work, etc. Now, next one down is very serious, is memory loss. And this, as you'll see in a minute, is actually the third biggest cause of uh, illness and death in this country in some cases. Okay? And I've added with this vision problems. Because vision problems seem to be much more abundant than what we imagine. It's only when you start to talk about vision with patients and how their eyes are that they begin to explain that they're deteriorating rapidly. Maybe they develop more serious problems like cataracts, glaucoma, uh, macular degeneration, and maybe it's just accommodation problems. Uh, the eyes are getting worse. So I put that in with that because they're all sort of neurological, etc. Arthritis, the arthritic pains, skin lesions, and then chest pains, which could be, you know, angina, or it could be something less serious. Okay, so those are the most, the ten most common conditions that people consult doctors and people about. Let's uh, extend that into the leading causes of men, uh, mortality, not mentality, <laughs> mortality. So in males, this is in England and Wales, and the last lot of produced figures is 2009, so these are a little bit out of date. These are not easily reproducible, the slide isn't very good, I'm afraid. That's why I haven't put them in your notes. Uh, number one is ischemic heart disease with males. Number two is malignant neoplasms of the trachea. So with these figures in 2009 with males, We've still got lung cancer high up there. But modern figures, um, provisional ones, put actually prostate up there now higher, uh, interestingly, than, than trachea and lung. Number three, cerebral vascular disease, in other words, strokes, TIAs, etc. Number four is chronic lower respiratory distress. Number five is influenza pneumonia. Six is neoplasms of the prostate, but that has, as I say, leapt up the charts a bit. And then seven, malignant neoplasms of the colon and, and gut. Number eight is dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And then other liver problems, et cetera, there. Okay, so that's males. So with females, ischemic heart disease, again, is number one. But the total number is less than in males. And interestingly, it's less premenopausally, but postmenopausally, it tends to catch up a lot. Number two is cerebral vascular disease. So in women, the cerebral vascular, the strokes, TIAs, are much more common than in males. Number three is dementia. So this is interesting, isn't it? Is it because women live longer than men, and therefore they're not getting the stimulation, uh, and they've generally, because they're aging, the dementia is being picked up much more? But it is interesting, isn't it? Number three with females is dementia, whereas it's further down the list with males. Number four, influenza and pneumonia. Malignant neoplasms of the lung, etc. Uh, and then it's more or less the same. And instead of prostate, we've got breast here as number seven, but otherwise it's, it's very similar. Okay, so the 10 most common diseases causing death in 2012. Okay, so uh, coronary ischemic disease, and this is what I've done, is added the two sexes together, so averaged it out. So coronary ischemic disease, that means hardening of the arteries leading to angina, 
leading to coronary uh, thrombosis, etc. Number two, cardiovas uh, cerebral vascular strokes. Number three, malignant neoplasms, particularly of the lung. Number four, pneumonia, diseases of pulmonary circulation. You know, it's lung diseases, bronchitis, you'll see, um, uh, uh, pulmonary disorders, congestive, uh, obstructive. Um, malignant neoplasms of the breast, number seven in total, liver disease, diabetes is crept in here, and hypertensive disease. Okay, now if we just have a look at that in this leading cause of death in the United States, we'll see that after 44 years of age, the two big ones are, of course, cardiovascular disease and malignancies. But when we get to 74, maybe 75, neoplasms begin to drop. So if you've made it to 75, the likelihood is you're less likely to get cancer, which is good. If you haven't got it by then, you're less likely to get it. So in other words, cancer is not a condition of aging, but of one of acquired at a particular vulnerable period in the middle years. Whereas you'll see the cardiovascular goes on rising. Okay, so in the end, heart will get you. Okay? So the obviously understanding the heart is very important. And as we say in our phonocardiography courses, 80% of all physicians die of heart disease. So it's rather important, even though they tend to choose not to really pay much attention to preventative work. So hypoxia, or lack of oxygen, may, be cause, or may cause ischemic heart disease. Okay, I think we're all familiar with that, because ischemic heart disease is a lack of oxygen, ultimately, to the coronary vessels. Cerebral vascular disease, um, Cancers, as we, when we did the cancer module, we learned that hypoxia is the key to all cancers because all malignancies work anaerobically or through glycolysis rather than through the aerobic pathways. Infections, and we'll see why infections as we go on, because we need oxygen to actually kill microbes. We need oxygen to survive, but we need free radicals or oxidative reactive oxygen species to do the killing by our immune system. Dementia. Dementia is really important because most of that is a lack of oxygen ultimately into the brain to get it to work. Diabetes and hypertension. Now, hypertension is most commonly due to a lack of oxygen in the body, so the heart pumps harder and the vessels contract to boost up the blood pressure to get more oxygen to the brain. Because basically it's hypoxia in the brain, so you increase your blood pressure in order to shoot more oxygen up to where it's needed in the brain. Diabetes, this was taken from the Daily Mail last week or the week before, of putting diabetics in a diver's tank with high pressure hyperbaric oxygen, which is quite interesting because it was saying that the lack of oxygen in, inside the cells inhibits the transfer of insulin and glucose into the cells. But I can't imagine that as a routine treatment for diabetics, but it was just interesting that diabetics do respond and their blood glucose levels comes down once they've been put in the hyperbaric chamber. So you can see probably the most common illnesses and the most common diseases that people actually die from are related to low levels of oxygen. Okay? And that staggered me because I realized now there's a common theme to the majority of our patients' problems. These are a few of the pioneers in our world Harvey Wiley was the first president of the FDA in America, and he was the first person to recognize that the milling of wheat to refine it would lead to disease, which ultimately he proved to be right because coronary artery disease and uh, all sorts of heart disease has come from the milling of wheat and the refining of sugar. Roy Lee, who started a standard process, did a lot of work with uh, early nutrients in the 1940s, 1950s. Western Price, as you may be aware, was one of the first people to study the occlusion and the dental, um, the jaw positions and things with people in different tribes through their diet. Linus Pauling, uh, in more modern times, with the discovery of the structure of collagen. Robert McCarrison did a lot of work in India uh, with the Hunzas and things with their diet and uh, health and longevity. Otto Warburg, who was the first person before the Second World War who got the Nobel Prize for discovering that cancer cells were hypoxic. So even back in the late 1920s, 1930s, it was realized that cancer cells were all hypoxic. And one of the treatments was to increase the oxygen supply to them. Francis Pottinger, who most of you have seen my uh, film on Pottinger's cats, how 
these cats were given denatured food um, over a period of time, and that the uh, dental problems, the heart disease, uh, the arthritis, etc., that the cats suffered from went on for several generations, even though they corrected them and put the cats back on raw meat and unpasteurized milk. But it took several generations to build the strength of the stock back up. And of course, George, who was the founder of applied kinesiology, um, who passed away a few years ago. So hypoxia is a condition in which the body or a region of the body is deprived of adequate oxygen supply. So remember, this is not anoxia. It's just a decrease in the availability of sufficient oxygen. Hypoxia may be classified as either generalized, in other words, all over the body, or systemic, or local, affecting one region of the body. The symptoms are, if it's gradual, which it is in most cases, is a lightheadedness. Sometimes it's a not very good memory. Numbness and tingling of the extremities, maybe. Nausea, loss of appetite. Tiredness, for sure, because we all are aware that oxygen is needed to create energy. But most of us are not really quite clear exactly where in the powerhouse the oxygen actually works, so we want to look at that. Uh, visual deterioration. Everybody will tell you when they're tired, their vision's not so good. When they feel good in themselves and their brain's working fine, their vision is better. And so the vision and tiredness go together. Feeling the cold. Anybody who says, oh, I'm always cold, or you shake their hand and it's the middle of the summer like now, and they're cold, this is hypoxia. And degenerative changes, because once you start shutting down the amount of oxygen, you decrease the respiration, and therefore you decrease the ATP and the repair of tissues, so the body starts to degenerate. So we're familiar with patients who come in and you touch them, uh, or they touch you rather in some way, and you go, ooh. It's usually my first patient of the day says the same to me. So when I put my hands on their back, they say, <laughs> um, because your hands are usually cold until you've got them starting work. But some people are like this all the time, aren't they? Their hands are always blue or cold. If we lose oxygen rapidly, then we get ataxia, which means we're unsteady on our feet, confusion, disorientation, hallucinations. This sounds like an old person, doesn't it? Like dementia. Um, behavior changes, severe headaches, reduced level of consciousness, papilledema, which is swelling behind on the macula of the eye, a breathlessness, as you'd expect, because they're trying to get in more oxygen, pallor, which means they look pale, tachycardia, because the heart's pumping harder and faster to get more oxygen around, and pulmonary hypertension. Okay, now if you want to experience hypoxia quickly, just go in a jet airplane, a fighter airplane, and turn over a few times at 40,000 feet. Okay. And apparently, pilots are trained not to think at this point, but to look at their instruments, because they suffer from hallucinations, because they don't know where they are. They look at the airplane and they can't get their orientation, so they have to just look at the instruments to correct the plane. So if hypoxia is very severe, a tissue may eventually turn gangrenous, if we don't have enough oxygen. Extreme pain may also be felt around the site, eventually leading to the late signs of cyanosis, bradycardia, pulmonar, and hypertension. So here is a lovely picture, isn't it? That's you know, just right after breakfast. Um, this is a gangrenous foot. So if you have a patient with that, you know you're certainly short of oxygen. Um, we get a lot of people who get varicose ulcers do you have patients with varicose ulcers? Um, or I seem to sometimes get patients with varicose ulcers. They've usually got very thin skin and it just doesn't repair. So we're going to learn what that is. And again, there's a common theme to these, like with all ulcerations, what the cause is. Right, because hemoglobin is a darker red when it is not bound to oxygen, known as deoxy, in other words, it's had the oxygen removed, as opposed to the rich red color that when it's bound to oxygen, which is called oxyhemoglobin. So when seen through the skin, it has an increased tendency to reflect blue light back to the eye. So when it's lacking oxygen, it appears to be <coughs> blue. When it's got lots of oxygen, it's a nice, rich red color. Hypoxia can result from a failure at any stage in the delivery of oxygen to the cells. This can include decreased partial pressure of the oxygen from outside, so we're climbing up Everest. We had a couple of patients 
uh, last week who'd been up to the base camp at Everest. And they'd gone with some friends. And the two friends of ours had trained in the gym for three months and were able to walk up to base camp uh, in an hour from where they were staying. Their friends had done no training. They lived in Florida, in uh, America, <laughs> and done no training at all. And it took them three hours, didn't it, to get up there, which meant they could only stay at base camp for one hour, whereas the others had four hours up there because they were unfit. Okay? So if you go up and you lose your partial pressure of oxygen because of the altitude, uh, you'll get a partial pressure decrease. Problems with diffusing oxygen in the lungs. In other words, you can't get the oxygen across from the lungs into the blood. Insufficient available hemoglobin. And this is a much bigger problem than what I'd ever imagined once we got into this. In other words, you haven't got sufficient correct levels of hemoglobin, mature hemoglobin. Problems with the blood flow to the end tissue. In other words, you've got some form of mechanical obstruction or maybe even uh, varicosities, etc. hardening of the arteries and problems with breathing uh, oxygen in to begin with. So, being holistic practitioners, we can say, well, there could be mechanical problems, couldn't there, related to the thorax, so we need to not forget these as far as breathing in and breathing out, etc. We can have biochemical problems within the delivery of the oxygen. And of course, our emotional side comes in here a lot as well because we get a lot of breathing problems when people are anxious uh, or depressed. So how did I come to these conclusions? What's the history here? Is some years ago, um, I bought a scanning device called Bioimpedance. And this is a very clever device. It had uh, electrodes on the soles of the feet, the hands, and across the forehead here. And it would measure for a few minutes the electrical impedance in different directions and build this lovely 3D picture up on the computer. Uh, and one of the things we found with it is it would pick out in various locations in the body where there was hypoxia. And at that time, I didn't know anything really about hypoxia, but I was always surprised deep in the brain just how hypoxic it was. So I used to regularly put myself on the machine, and if I had done a day's work on the computer preparing a seminar, for instance, and then I would do a scan, I was amazed at the end of the day just how little activity there was in the brain. It was practically asleep because you were cutting, pasting, looking something up. You weren't really deeply working there. Whereas a day in clinic or a day teaching and every lobe was firing away. Okay? And that's why you'll find a day in clinic is much more exciting than a day reading a book. Um, but I was thought, you know, working on the computer, doing a module, would be really, really uh, getting the brain going. But you can imagine now, if you're in a job where you're just pushing a pen all day or working on a computer, you actually don't use your brain really very much at all. And then you hear adverts on the radio at the moment a lot for something like a million old people who haven't seen another person for a month. And you think, gosh, how do they stimulate their brain at all? Because the biggest stimulation to the brain is talking to somebody else, isn't it? If you're on your own listening to television, listening to the radio, reading the paper, etc., there's really no activity in there at all. And as we know, if you don't use it, you lose it. So this is important there. Okay, so bioimpedance was very interesting because it told me or showed me just how many tissues, particularly the brain, are affected by uh, hypoxia. So this is a modern version of that, the one I had, um, but a very, very good, interesting piece of machinery. So it would come up with all these measurements about oxygen flow, blood flow, etc., cetera, uh, and function. And then last year, about this time, we got interested in listening to the heart as far as the sounds that it makes, called phonocardiography. And we learned that we have two sounds with the heart, lub-dub, and these are the closure of the valves. And the first sound here is the closure of the, of the um, tricuspid and the mitral valves between the atriums and the, and the ventricles. And this reflects the contraction of the ventricles. So when the ventricles contract, uh, the back pressure shuts those valves, so we get a lub and then we get a dub as the blood flows and shuts the aortic and the pulmonary vessels. But the first sound here should be roughly twice or more the size of the second sound. So everything is really quite good with this particular one, um, but we'd like to get that first sound up a bit. Okay? So this is what the books sh show as being perfect. And then we discovered that hardly anybody shows it. But the majority, by far, come in like this. So the first sound here, you can see, is hardly there. 
So you can imagine this person belting around the track or going off for a jog in the morning, and there's no first sound hardly. That means they're not contracting their ventricles enough to shoot blood containing the nutrients, and particularly oxygen, the ultimate nutrient, to the brain and to the muscle tissue. So the first place when you don't get enough oxygen or nutrients that you're going to find symptoms of is where you use it most, and that's going to be your nervous tissue. So your nervous tissue uses more oxygen and energy than anywhere else in the body, per neuron, if you like, per cell. And this is because to fire the brain, to get the pumps to pump out calcium and sodium requires ATP. So nerve cells contain hundreds of mitochondria. So they have hundreds of little powerhouses in there. Muscles have loads. Other cells only have one powerhouse. Okay, so the first place you therefore see symptoms of a lack of oxygen is going to be in the brain and in the muscles. So this is what we found here, and we couldn't work out how to get this up. We were looking for the obvious sort of nutrients and things for a long time. Uh, and the most common one that came up here was magnesium. We all know that magnesium sort of works in relationship to muscle contractions and things, but we're not all totally sure how it works. We know there's a relationship between calcium and magnesium, and magnesium regulates calcium influx, etc., etc. But they all did muscle tests, and what we did is we discovered that if you feed back that sound that the person makes in their heart through headphones, which in other words through a biofeedback uh, system, uh, the person would go weak, particularly in the subscapularis muscles, and the most common nutrient to show was magnesium of one form or another. And this helped to build up a lot of first sounds. What I didn't realize for a long time was if your first sound isn't strong, you're not going to pump sufficient oxygen and nutrients to the brain and to the muscles. And but equally, if you're not producing enough energy in the first place, the muscle can't contract. So the contraction of the muscle depends upon the ability of ATP. ATP has to go into the muscle fiber to get it to contract in the beginning. It's one of the reasons why we make ATP, to have energy to make muscles contract. So it's a vicious circle. So it could be that we're getting a result of the symptoms is a, loss of, uh, a lack of oxygen being delivered to the tissue, but also at the same time we're not producing enough energy, and maybe that's why magnesium comes in, because we know magnesium is very important with the pathway of producing energy. So that's how we began to put it together. But there was a lot of other bits to the jigsaw puzzle. So diminished first sounds. 80% of patients show a decreased first sound. And the majority of these, the cause or the result, was a hypoxia, as you'd imagine, because the heart isn't contracting hard enough. And therefore, it's contracting. And you can't say whether the person's getting 40% blood flow, 90%, 95%. We don't know, but it's not big enough. Remember, that first sound should be twice the size of the second sound. And then we got interested in oxygen saturation, which is a term referring to the concentration of oxygen in the blood. The human body requires and regulates a very precise and specific balance of oxygen. Normal blood oxygen levels in humans should be 100%. I have never found anybody on an oximeter who's 100%. You know, in fact, I tell a lie, there was one person I had as a patient and she had got pulmonary, um, uh, severe pulmonary emphysema. Uh, and so I was very impressed that her, her, her SATs, her oxygen saturation, was 100%, and her first sound was twice the size of the second sound. This is really good. What I didn't know is five minutes before she was being examined, she'd been on oxygen. <laughs> she had an oxygen cylinder by the side of the chair, which I didn't see. And she said, oh, could it be because I've taken the oxygen? And she told me, she said, sometimes if I don't do this, she said, I go as low as 70%. She said, when I'm 70%, I'm fading away. Um, so they talk about if the level is below 90, it's considered hypoxia. Anything below 100% is hypoxia. It's very important because the saturation drops down quite quickly once you get down into the lower 90s. You know, when you get to so 83, 84, uh, no, sorry, 93, 92, 91, it drops down quite steeply and you get a lot of severe symptoms. So I think most of us are actually operating at a hypoxic level, it's just relative where it is. And we'll use the oximeter um, and we'll demonstrate that because they're very easy things to get. So blood oxygen you know, below 80% are considered severe. In medicine, oxygen saturation, commonly referred to as SATs, if you watch the television programs like Casualty, the first thing the uh, paramedics go in, isn't it, and take the SATs, measures the percentage of haemoglobin binding sites in the bloodstream occupied by oxygen. 
at around 90%, according to clinical oxygen saturation, increases according to the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation path. So you can see here that at 100% it starts to drop, and obviously these sort of figures are really emergency, uh, much more severe. But any drop from 100% is going to be noticeable because you're not going to have enough oxygen to supply to make ATP in the mitochondria in the brain first, followed by the muscles and then the other tissues. Now, luckily, we've got a lot of brain. We've got billions and billions and billions of neurons there. And we've got a lot of muscle fibers. So we actually don't notice when we're not working them. Okay? Or if they've died. Okay, you don't know because you get used to not having bits of your brain <laughs> after a while, and so you don't know whether it's there or it's not. You talk to a dementia person, they don't know. And one of the questions they often ask is, when did you notice that you were losing your memory? And they say, I don't know. Because they don't know when they were losing the memory, uh, because they had no idea of being able to fix the time and things. So dementia isn't always a bad state. It can be quite a happy state. There's no stress, because you can't remember the stress as well. So if you're getting like that, you've got hypoxia. What we find today is all of us have got hypoxia, okay? We're all degenerating, but it's a matter of the degree, isn't it? And it's nice to know, you know, are you 99%, 98, 97, or whatever it is? And there are ways of working this out as to how much a person is actually degenerating and how hypoxic they are. Okay, so don't base this all, you know, we've got to get to 50, 60% between, before we know the symptoms. You will get symptoms at 99 but you might not be aware of what those symptoms are. It might be the first sound isn't quite as great. It might be your vision. It might be your stamina is not so great. When, as we'll see later on today, you're under exercise, in other words, you're belting off down to catch the bus, or round the track, or whatever it might be, you use up to 50 times the amount of oxygen, 50 times, to work out aerobically. That means to increase your pulse rate by 180 minus your age. So if you're 50 and you push your pulse to 130, you will use 50 times more oxygen than when you're just sitting there. Where does that oxygen come from? Interesting, isn't it? How is it that you can belt off down there and use 50 times the amount? And the answer is you store it, believe it or not. Not only do you breathe it in, but you actually store the oxygen in something called myoglobin inside the muscle cells. So you've got a reserve of oxygen that you don't use really until you need it, which in other words, when you belt off down the track. So if your level of myoglobin is low, you haven't got your reserve fuel. So if you run out of energy very much quicker. I found that once I understood this, that the amount of people who are really deficient in uh, specific nutrients to make ATP, uh, like magnesium and the vitamin Bs and so on, is really quite small in comparison to the number of people who just haven't got enough oxygen. Okay? So one of the ways of looking at this is to say you've got the old burner as a boiler, okay? and you get the fuel into there, and in other words, you're getting the fuel in all right, but your damper is in, so you're not getting the air in anymore. Okay? So we've got to open the damper up, get the oxygen in, and then your fuel can burn. Okay? So yes, you've got to have the fuel, and in the majority of cases, people have got the fuel. Maybe it's not quite the quality that you want, but you have got fuel. But 80% of our problems with people is the, but the damper is in, and they're not getting enough air into the boiler, or in other words, into your mitochondria. So it's just a matter of where it is. And obviously, the more severe it is, the more severe symptoms, and the quicker you go downhill. Now, the simplest way is, an ox is a pulse oximeter, which relies on light absorption characteristics of measuring the hemoglobin. We'll do this on each person as we go along. And these are something you can buy from Amazon at about 18, 20 pounds. They're not expensive. And they're considered to be pretty reliable. Okay? They give you the pulse reading. And at the same time, they will give you the saturation of the blood. Very easy. One of the things we learn when we teach in the clinic, which we do in uh, our Los Angeles, is they like to use two. One on the index finger of each hand. And because sometimes it's different. Because, of course, the blood gets from here to here quicker than it gets from here to here. But it's slightly slower to get to here. Not much, because it's about 16 seconds from here to there and back again. Okay, so the blood actually spurts around very, very quickly. 
But of course, in that 16 seconds, not all blood flows through every single little capillary and back, okay? But the fastest blood flow, in other words, if you inject something into your blood, it'll go around your body in roughly 16 or 20 seconds. That's why when the um, anaesthetist puts the jab into you when you're going to have your operation and says, now, I put it in, I want you to count slowly from one to 10. Nobody ever makes it, do they? Because <laughs> you say, okay. One, two, <laughs> and it's gone. It's gone that quick. Because from the vein, round the heart, back up the carotid vessels into the head, and bong, you're asleep. It's very, very fast like that. Okay? But there is a slight difference, and we've observed that, haven't we, that sometimes it's one or two degrees of saturation. So sometimes what I like to do is to put the oximeter on one of the toes. Usually the big toe is too big. The second toe is a good one. It's about the size of a finger. So you can get away with it. So about the second toe in, because sometimes people have freezing cold feet, don't they? But their hands are not too bad, OK? So what we want to do is to be able to measure what's going in inside here, isn't it, really? Or the deepest tissues. And that's why the nearest we can probably do from the outside is to stick it on the toes and try and get a reading. Because you might not get the same level. You might have 99 here, uh, 98, say, here. But you could have 95 down on your second toe. So that none of that we know is what goes on right deep in, say, the uh, cerebellum. OK, but they're very good. At least they give you an idea. You can't use them as a feedback. In other words, you can't read the reading there and do a muscle test. <laughs> that would be lovely, wouldn't it, if you could do that and say, oh, that's 98, 99, et cetera. Um, but it gives you a good idea. And also patients, of course, like electrical information because they think it's so accurate. Okay. What they don't know is, of course, if you turn it a little bit here, there, you get all sorts of readings and things. And if a person's stressed, the pulse rate goes up and so on. But at that time, at that moment, you can safely say, yes, you've got 98%. And if next time they come in and they're 99, they're happy. And if they're 95, you begin to think, well, what's wrong? Yeah. But there are variables during the day with all of us, as we'll see, whether you're stressed, whether you're hungry, etc., which may alter it. Now. Those were the three things that I got me interested. Um, so uh, the phonocardiography um, and the bioimpedance originally and the oximeters verify the fact, yeah, this is a serious problem. This is something which is being totally overlooked by all practitioners. The people who are most interested, I discovered in hypoxia, are the river authorities who are very keen to know how much oxygen is in the water of the rivers because the fish depend upon oxygen, believe it or not. When your goldfish doesn't have enough and you go away for the weekend and you forgot to switch the aerator on, you come back, either your goldfish is dead or it's on its side, isn't it? Uh, and that's because it hasn't got any oxygen. And the most hungry oxygen area of the body is the cerebellum. And the cerebellum helps us with our coordination and our vestibular mechanism. So it's the first place, which is why you feel dizzy in the head and you lose you know, maybe severe ataxia or coordination uh, when you don't have enough oxygen. So you put it down to, ah, oh, it's just one of those funny things, it's my neck or something. You get up from lying down to standing and you go, ooh, <laughs> like that. And you think, oh, uh, what you don't realize is, of course, you're not getting enough blood up into the cerebellum. So the cerebellum is called the small brain. There's more neurons in the cerebellum than in the whole of the cortex. Just they're compressed into a small a bit like a black hole. There's a lot of neurons in a very small area at the back of the head there. Uh, so that's the first place that you'll see hypoxic or lack of symptoms, lack of, lack of oxygen symptoms. Okay. So then I thought, well, how are we going to put this, how can we apply this into our kinesiology? Okay. What do we see? And the first thing we often see when people don't have enough oxygen is they haven't got energy, because that's where we're going to be using it. So all muscles are weak on manual muscle testing. We get this, don't we, with patients? Hopefully not very often, but you get the patient who lies down, they tell you their story, you do the first muscle test and it's not very strong, you choose another muscle and another and another one, and they're all weak. And I don't mind those because you just work in reverse and find out what strengthens. Because we always explain, you know, what strengthens a patient is good, what weakens you is bad, but we'll have to do this the other way around because whatever strengthens you has got to be good in some way. And we used to find that water helps. Now, water also contains a lot of oxygen, funny enough, OK? We think about bubbly water, but that's carbon dioxide. But water, as we'll see by Henry's law of diffusion, contains a lot of water. That's how fish live, 
Okay? So it could be that it's not water that strengthens, but the oxygen that you're actually giving them. Sometimes just breathing a few times will do it. So if you put O2 on, it was a simulated copy of oxygen, of pure oxygen, the majority of these patients strengthen. I used to put ATP on, but of course ATP requires oxygen to make it. So it could be that it's the oxygen to make the ATP, which is the strengthening factor in the majority of cases. So a single muscle weakens on repeated muscle testing. You know that one once a second when you do it in the test? Okay, you do it 10 times and then you muscle test and the muscle goes weak. That's an aerobic challenge, isn't it? So it's aerobic and that means you use oxygen, doesn't it? Okay, anaerobic means you don't use it, you use glycosyl. So we found that positive eyes into distortion up and down was again something which we'll, we'll talk about up and down, up and down is an indication of hypoxia, which really is the same as this. It's a muscle test from the extreme of one end to the other, so it's an aerobic test really. A weak muscle strengthens to oxygen, or O2. Now, I remember Wally Smith in the States, he used to actually have a little oxygen cylinder and they would do this with people and put a whiff of oxygen and if the muscle strengthened that, it would indicate hypoxia. I don't think we need to do, to that extent, have a small oxygen cylinder. We can just use a vial of the simulated copy of oxygen. And in a minute, I'll tell you how to test the reverse, because sometimes we need a muscle to go weak, so that we can then work out what it is that makes them go strong, related to oxygen, to know we're specifically talking about oxygen. And a lot of people say, and I thought, yes, myself, CO2, and I think you learned a lot about CO2 yesterday, but CO2 is not necessarily the counterpart. Yes, at the end of respiration, or uh, making, uh, making ATP, you produce carbon dioxide as a byproduct, but when the oxygen is low, CO2 is going to be low, because obviously if you've got less fuel being going in, or less gas, you're going to have less exhaust out the other end. So having weakening to carbon dioxide actually may not mean that you've got low oxygen, so it's not a good test. Uh, in fact, you may strengthen the carbon dioxide because you're actually low in carbon dioxide. And we know that we produce four molecules of the sort of bigger Krebs cycle of carbon dioxide is produced. So actually somebody who strengthens the carbon dioxide must usually indicates they've got a malfunctioning Krebs cycle. But a strong muscle weakens to xanthine oxidase is an enzyme which, as we'll see in a minute, is always related to hypoxia and is actually stimulated in hypoxic states. So xanthine oxidase as a marker is probably a better way of guaranteeing a person weakens to uh, the manual muscle test and is an indication of hypoxia. Uh, 